All right, guys, uh, last class of the day. Thank you all so much uh, for coming to the Tax Slayer Seminar 2017. Um, wherever you may be traveling to after this, uh, please have safe travels, safe flights, whatever it may be. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on everything. Uh, I have with me uh, the beautiful Mary Booker, who is with Tax Slayer. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation or anything like that um, that are not specifically with the presentation, please feel free to ask her. Um, my name is Andrew Wilder. I am a tax, uh, prefer or tax preparer and partner at Rhodes Murphy. Um, so like you guys, I am in the thicket of it during tax season. Uh, I have uh, last year, I probably saw around 800 clients or so. And so I know many of the questions that you get asked on a normal basis. Um, and so it's gonna be fun going through this. And so basically what Mary and my job to do today is to make sure that you understand the 2017 tax law changes and updates that are gonna be coming to you this tax season. Um, and to make sure that you know that what could possibly be coming down the road a little bit. And so uh, things we're gonna discuss in this class are gonna be individual, uh, business, estate and gift tax, and then some practitioner information that we always go through at the end. Um, now, one thing I will say is that Thursday, um, I was able to come here to the Tax Slayer Seminar. I was able to be out of the office for a number of hours. Wednesday night, had a great dinner with the wife, different things like that. Come here, happy as can be. In the middle of it, I get informed that a tax law reform is being passed in the House. Um, and now my day changed um, because I knew I had to wake up this morning at 5 a.m. and go through and to kind of give some information. Now, the important thing to know about the tax law reform that we're actually gonna talk about, which I'm gonna give David Elijah these slides are not in the slides that you actually have because I do it this morning. Um, but the important thing to know is that these are not finalized yet. These are just things that are being discussed. However, I think it's important that we discuss it today simply because you're gonna get asked about this when you're working out, going to the post office, going to the grocery store, whenever you see your clients out and about, they're gonna to start to ask about this because this is a part of the media that's pushing right now. This is kind of front page stuff right now. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we cover it and look at it in a little bit more in depth. Now, the first thing that I'll say about the house reform or the house version of it is that this is the bill that has only been passed in the house. There are currently around three bills that are being passed in the Senate, okay? And so there are a number of different things being discussed. Um, however, all these bills share some similarities, some ideas, or some ideals, um, and then they also have their differences. And so they're gonna have to be discussed um, in length before they actually go into uh, circulation. All right, first thing first, uh, whenever we're talking about the tax law reform that the House has, First thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna to wanna to double the standard deduction. So basically for me and my wife, let's use us as an example, our uh, standard deduction for this year currently is 12,700. That now jumps to 24,400. And that is a huge jump when you start thinking about the ability to actually stand or uh, take itemized deductions. So you're gonna double the standard deduction. We're gonna eliminate exemptions, okay? And so basically for me and my wife, still so using that example, 12,700 and 8,100 will be our deductions and exemptions respectively. That would go up to 24,400. Now for us, this would actually be a good thing if we itemize or if we take the standard deduction. However, there was an employee of Rhodes Murphy a couple of years ago who has around eight children. And basically this would, this would just completely kill his ability to take uh, the exemptions and would completely increase his tax liability. In his scenario, he probably has around a $50,000 standard deduction and exemption combined, and his tax liability is next to nothing. However, in this scenario, he basically drops down to $24,000, and we're talking about a possible $4,000 change in his taxes in that year. Another thing that's gonna jump right off the page whenever you start looking at the tax law reform for this, uh, for, from the House is that they're gonna decrease the number of brackets and expand the gap between the brackets. So the first thing that's gonna come into play, the tax brackets are gonna come in, you're only gonna have four. You're gonna have the first one starting at 12%, then it's gonna jump up 25%, then it goes 35%, and then 39.6 with a surtax of 6% added on top of that once you go past a certain, certain threshold. For married filing joint individuals, that threshold is around a million dollars. For single filers, that amount is around $500,000. Now, important thing to note is that even though we are decreasing the number of brackets that are there, we're increasing the gap between them. So let me give you an example. For the 12% bracket on a single individual from zero to $45,000, that individual's income tax bracket is 12%. 
In the current format that we currently stand in, that individual at $45,000, using the same example, is in the 25% bracket once he reaches $37,000, $38,000. So you're talking about a drastic change here, okay? Kind of give you an example, still using our single individual. Let's say that individual goes to $200,000, which is where the next bracket comes into play. The 25% bracket here goes from $45,000 to $200,000. That individual at $200,000 is in the 33% bracket. And so if you're specifically looking at the brackets themselves, it looks like the tax law reform could be a good thing for a number of our clients. However, if you're only looking at that example, you're not looking at the whole picture of what they're discussing. A Couple of other things that actually come into play. Uh, another thing is gonna be the expansion of the child tax credit to $1,600. So you're still gonna have the $1,000 refundable portion of the child tax credit, whether or not you're taking it on the child tax credit line or the additional child tax credit line. But one thing that's gonna come in is there's gonna be $600 added in that is additional. This amount is a non-refundable portion. And so it's basically gonna be stuck up there with the child tax credit in that above the line, what I would say credit. And one thing, another thing that's gonna happen is you're actually gonna have the phase out rates that actually increase. Most of the time for our single individuals, around $75,000, um, the basically they're done away with as far as the child tax credit goes, it completely disappears. For a single individual in this new reform, we're talking about $115,000. That way they are able to still see the child tax credit on their tax return. Same thing with married filing joint, around $120,000 is whenever it's normally phased out for those married filing joint individuals. That goes up to $230,000. So they're able to get the benefit of the child tax credit at that point. One important thing to notice if you're actually sitting here paying attention is the $600 is non-refundable. That is not going to apply to most of our EIC clients. And the reason why is because it's a non-refundable portion, their tax liability is basically already nil, and they're actually not getting the child tax credit, they're getting the additional child tax credit. And so it's gonna be something that a lot of our EIC clients really don't get. It's gonna be more for those clients who are around the $120,000 range, something like that, that normally don't see uh, the additional or the child tax credit. This is gonna actually help them, okay? Something new that's actually gonna come in possibly with reform is a new family tax credit. A uh, number of years we had the making work pay credit was basically $400 per individual in the return that worked. Something very similar to that. We're talking $300 for every individual over the age of 16, so basically 17 and upward. So when we're used to telling our clients, uh, you've already reached the threshold for your son who's 17, he's not gonna get a $1,000 credit. Now you can actually inform them, hey, there's a possibility of a $300 credit that child can still get. However, me and my wife, we don't have children. We still benefit from this one. We still get $300 each and so now we have a $600 credit that we're not used to getting. Uh, right now, there aren't any thresholds on that one, so I'm not sure if they're gonna do any phase outs. I would think they would probably be similar to what we actually see up here with the 115 for single, 230 for married filing joint, the, uh, the child tax credit. Important thing to note is that we have individuals who often claim their parents on their tax return, whether they're live-in mother, live-in father, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a disabled cousin, uh, brother, things along those lines who can't care for themselves. They actually get the credit for them as well. $300 actually comes into play and they actually get that, okay? It's a one way that they're actually kind of curtailing not having the exemptions is actually putting this on there. Now, of course, it's not a direct, um, uh, a direct makeup of what they're doing with the exemptions, because I think the exemptions are worth probably around $1,000, depending on the situation, um, but it's getting closer. All right, another thing that's gonna come into play is actually gonna be looking at our itemized deductions and our above the line deductions that we're used to on the 1040. Now, as far as our itemized deductions go, um, the bill is actually looking to get rid of uh, the state and local income taxes that you take as itemized deductions and sales tax as a deduction, okay? And then, if that's not enough, they're gonna reduce the amount of allowed property tax deduction to $10,000. One thing I always tell, or one thing I always tell my clients is that whenever you're actually looking to itemize, there are three main things that make it where you itemize. One is gonna be your charitable deductions, 
Two is going to be your mortgage interest, and three is going to be the taxes that you pay, whether it be property, state, whatever it may be. They're already increasing the standard deduction, and then they're going to get rid of this. It's going to basically get it where a lot of people are probably taking the standard deduction. Okay. Another thing that's going to happen is it's going to eliminate the ability to claim other deductions, whether it be on our Schedule A, above the line deductions, different things. Medical expenses is going to be one of them, which I'm going to actually talk about a little bit later. Uh, because there is a raise this year actually coming from the medical expenses. They're actually going to exclude tax prep fees, alimony payments, student loan interest, and moving expenses. Okay. Now as a part of this, if they're actually going to get away or take away the alimony payments, I think that would actually be a separation that they would take away on the income statement as well on the front page of the 1040. Something else that would possibly be eliminated by this? alternative minimum tax okay now we don't really have a lot of clients who are affected by this um, simply because it starts at around fifty thousand dollars basically for single individuals but there's not really a lot of people that really hit the thresholds or the proper uh, the proper places to actually turn into alternative minimum tax but for those individuals hundred and fifty two hundred thousand dollars this is where that's actually going to come into play another possibility with the reform is actually might uh, eliminate the estate tax. Now this could be delayed until 2024, but during that time period until its elimination, uh, they actually want to double the exemption level that is there. So that 5.5 million that we're going to get this year, that actually would become around 11 million dollars that you get for a single individual as far as the estate tax goes. Now the thing with this is that it really doesn't affect too many of our clients, if we're actually being honest. Uh, the reason why is if you have a client who comes in with $10 million in a trust, most likely they're seeing a tax lawyer, different things along those lines, where they're actually splitting up the assets or making sure the assets are properly handled and taken care of to actually get below the threshold in the estate tax. They're doing the proper things and taking the proper steps to actually decrease their tax liability. However, this is something that affects about 20 to 50 of our clients per year. Now I have the capability of actually talking to a cousin-in-law who's a very good tax lawyer, or I'm sorry, a, a estate lawyer in town, and he and I have this discussion a lot, is that if they're going to do away with this, the estate tax, they're most likely going to do away with this. They're going to most likely repeal uh, the step-up basis that you have on inherited property. Now this is something that affects a lot of our clients on a yearly basis. It may affect them only once or twice in their lifetimes, but this is something that heavily helps them out. You have a client who comes in who their parents bought a piece of property in 1950 for $10,000. They died a couple years ago. Now that property is worth $200,000. That is how you get loyal clients is by telling them they have the step up basis. Now they're going to do away with it. And so those clients who are sitting there holding on to property, trying to wait for it to appreciate or not getting the right price on a certain amount of property, you might want to tell them about this because it is a very real possibility that if they're discussing this, has already been passed in the house, that this could actually come into play in some form or manner, okay? And so if they're holding onto that piece of property, they're trying to worry about that appreciated value, and then all of a sudden their step-up basis completely disappears, they have literally just screwed themselves out of a lot of money and they're gonna have to turn around and pay a lot of taxes. So what does this mean for us? Well, currently it means nothing. It's just discussion. It's only been passed in the House. It hasn't gone to the Senate yet. They haven't gone through and done their recalculations on what they want to do, things along those lines. And so right now, it doesn't mean anything. However, there is discussion in the Senate on this matter. It's already been passed in the House. And so this is actually becoming more true than it has been in the past. In the past, this has just been conversation. Now it's actually going through the process of becoming a bill. Most likely, if we're being honest, it's probably not going to take place until the 2018 calendar year, 2019 tax season. So it wouldn't be this next tax season that we'd have to worry about it. However, there's something I want you to know is that this bill was introduced two weeks ago to the House, and it already went through and passed. And so it is a possibility that they could push it through. However, most likely not going to happen because the Senate wants to get a hold of it and do what they want to do with it. One thing about the tax law reform that they're actually discussing, health care is not something that's actually discussed in the reform itself. Uh, it's something that the current administration, uh, President Trump, actually wants to go through and actually kind of wants to make changes himself. Um, but it's not going to be a discussion as far as this uh, reform goes until a later time. So what does this mean for us? Well, 
You have to be more informed on something that is discussion, but a little bit more discussion. Um, you're going to have clients coming up to you. They're going to be very worried about this because this is going to be in the news. And you have to sit here and calm them down and say, okay, we're just going to handle this situation as best as possible. Um, we're going to do the best we can for you. Um, we're going to be knowledgeable in the situation. You're going to be knowledgeable. We're going to do what we can to actually decrease your tax liability underneath the new reform. However, as the discussion goes earlier, whenever I was talking about most people aren't going to be getting itemized deductions anymore, it's probably going to mean less work, which probably means a decrease in our fees. Okay. All right, so things that are actually taking place in 2017 that are actually going into effect, that we're actually going to see this coming tax season that we know. All right, standard deduction. In 2017, we saw a slight increase across the board. Uh, for single individuals, we saw an increase to 6,350. For married filing joint individuals, we saw a de increase to 12,700. For married filing separate, 6,350. For head of household, 9,350, and for qualifying widow, 12,700. As far as our brackets go, it's going to be across the board with single, head of household, married filing joint, married filing separate, and qualifying widow. We're going to see an increase in those numbers, uh, basically by a couple of hundred or maybe $2,000, simply because of inflationary purposes that happens every single year. We're used to it. Um, and so basically what we're going to see for single rates, 10% uh, is going to jump up to 9,325. 15% uh, between 9,326 and 37,950, and then 25% on the amount that we would discuss up to 91,900. And then it goes, continues to go up along from there. Now, as far as the discussion goes about the tax law reform that we're actually having, basically what's gonna happen is that the 12% bracket that we're discussing would actually cover the 10, the 15, and part of the 25% bracket up to $45,000. The 25% bracket, which actually goes up to $200,000, would actually cover the 25% bracket, the 28% bracket, and the 23% bracket. And so someone in that area is not getting hit with the 28% bracket on the amount of money between 91 and 191, or the 33% on the $9,000 remaining there of the $200,000. They're actually getting the 25% bracket there, okay? Married filing joint, same thing. We're going to see slight increases across the board in our discussion of where they're going to land. Uh, for 10%, it's going to jump up to 18,650. For 15%, it's going to jump up to 75,900. And then for 25%, it's going to jump up to 153,100. To give you an example of this in the tax reform law, basically the first $90,000 is going to be in the 12% bracket. Same thing follow along with the single. It's going to jump all the way down to the 25% bracket until we see any changes. And then with the 25% bracket, it actually jumps down to 260000 So you're actually falling into a 33% bracket. Now, we do have those clients who actually are going to be hit with this. And so they're going to be um, okay because they're not hitting the 28% bracket. They're not hitting the 33% bracket. They're staying in that 25% range. Now, the big one that we're going to see is 39.6%. Um, as far as that bracket goes, does not come into effect until one million dollars. Think about someone who is from 470,000 to one million dollars, how they're not having to pay that 39.6. They're staying at the 35% bracket that entire time. That is a huge difference for them because you're talking probably about $20,000 in there that it's going to change for them. Married filing separate basically is going to mirror what we're going to see with a single bracket. Um, the 10% on the 9,325, uh, the 15% on 37,950, 25% on 76,550, and it continues onward and upward from there for inflationary purposes. Head of household, same thing, 10% on the first 13,350, 15% 15 on the 50,800, and then 25% on the 131,200. Now, as far as our standard deduction goes that we're actually going to see for the year, um, the additional standard deduction for age or blindness uh, for single head of household is actually going to stay the same from 2016 to 2017. It's going to stay at the 1550. Same thing for married filing joint, married filing separate, qualifying widow. Uh, it's going to stay at the 1250, the additional there. Personal exemption is going to stay the same, 2017. Uh, it's going to stay at that 4050 number that we recognized from last year. And then the AGI phase outs are going to slightly go up. Um, once you actually hit uh, single 261 500, you're going to start to see the exemption starting to go away. Once you hit 384, it's completely gone. 
married filing joint or qualifying widow, basically 313 is where it starts, and then it goes away at 436, 300. Head of household, 287, 650, you're gonna to start to see the personal <coughs> exemption diminish, and by the time it reaches 410, 150, it's completely gone. Uh, same thing for married filing separate, 156, 900 is the start number, and then 218, 150 is the end. All right, as far as our high incomers go with itemized deductions, these are going to be the numbers that actually trigger, trigger them starting to see a decrease as far as their AGI goes. Uh, once it starts exceeding these numbers, one of two things are going to happen. Uh, they're either going to get the lesser of 3% of AGI above certain thresholds, or they're going to get 80% of allowable itemized deductions. Now one thing to remember when we're talking about the, the allowable itemized deductions is that this rule does not apply to medical expenses, investment interest expenses, casualty theft loss, gambling losses, things like that. In our discussion earlier when we were talking about the tax reform, um, one thing that we brought up was the actual uh, just complete uh, loss of the medical expenses. One thing that's going to actually happen in 2017 is that our, every taxpayer is going to have to uh, be subject to a 10% floor on the medical expenses. In 2016, for those individuals above 65, uh, that floor was basically 7.5%. Now it's actually moving up to 10%. Okay? As far as standard mileage rates go, we're going to see a decrease in the amount of expenses that we can take here. We're going to see a decrease in the amount of expenses that we can take here. Basically with mileage rates going down over the past couple years, Congress is going to basically continue to decrease the amount of cents per mile that they're actually going to give you. In 2017, that business number is going to go down to 53 and a half cents. In medical and moving, it's going to go down to 17 cents. And then in the charitable portion, it's actually going to stay the same at the 14 cents there. As far as long-term care goes, um, basically the amounts that our uh, tax clients take out on their contracts that they have on themselves, um, the limit on the tax-free payout is still going to be 350. Uh, the premiums, however, are going to jump up. Age 71 or older, it's going to increase to 5,110 for 2017. 61 to 70, it's going to go to 4,090. 51 to 60 is 1,530. 41 to 50 is 770, and then under the age of 40, it's going to be 410. Foreign earned income exclusion, going to see a slight increase on this of around $800. This is going to go up to $102,100 in 2017. Uh, make sure you have all the proper documentation when you're actually filling out that form. Make sure your client was there for the, maximum, or the number of days they're supposed to have been there. Uh, make sure it's filled out properly. As far as the adoption credit goes, same thing. Make sure your client has all the backup material that they need uh, in order to claim the adoption credit. Um, that credit, however, is going to jump up $90 in 2017 to $13,570. If you do have any clients who actually fall into the category and able to take the adoption credit, be sure to tell them it's going to be a long process because this is a large credit that we're talking about. And so we're talking about our 9 to 10 month process that the IRS is going to go through and make sure that everything was done properly with this credit. As far as the phase outs go for the adoption credit, once you get around 203, 540, you're going to start to see the credit start to diminish a little bit. By the time you reach 243, 540, that credit is completely phased out. A couple years ago, uh, the Congress actually came through and said, okay, we're going to add a little bit of a tax on our high income earners, uh, basically referring to the Medicare tax that we have here. Um, and so what's going to happen is for these individuals in this range and in this filing status, they're going to see a 0.9% increase on their wages above that, above that amount. One thing that has happened over the past few years that we're going to see a lot uh, on W-2s whenever clients come in, uh, we're actually going to see the Social Security wage limit, it's actually going to increase this year quite substantially. Over the past couple of years, it has been increasing a couple of years ago, I think four or five, um, it was around 110 was this Social Security wage limit. Now, in 2016, it was 118. In 2017, it's going to go up almost $9,000 to 127,200. In 2018, it's projected that number is going to be 128,7. And most likely in 2019, we're going to see an increase, but I would expect an increase along these lines. The reason why I'm saying that is because these numbers a couple years ago weren't projected to come out until 2021, something along those lines. They have moved that time frame up. As far as traditional IRAs go, the numbers are going to stay the same as far as contributions. Uh, for those clients who are underneath the age of 50, it's going to still be that 5500 And then the catch-up is going to be there for those over the age of 50. They're going to get that additional $1,000 up to $6,500. 
But as far as the phase outs go, we're gonna see slight changes in those uh, just for inflation purposes. For single filers covered by plan, 62 to 72,000 is where we're gonna see it uh, either start to diminish or completely diminish. Same thing for married filing joint, the phase out, uh, both covered by plan, 99 to 119 is whenever it starts, diminishes and then gets completely lost. And then married filing joint with only one spouse covered, uh, 184 to 194 is the numbers there. Alternative minimum tax, which is something that we might not have to worry about after um, the bill comes into play or if, whenever it comes into play. Um, for single head of household, we're gonna see a slight increase to 54,300. For married filing joint, 84,500. And then married filing separate, it's gonna be 42,250. As far as Roth IRAs go, uh, the contribution stayed the same basically as far as the traditional goes. Um, that 5,500 number is going to be there for those underneath the age of 50. 6,500 over the age of 50. And then the phase out contributions, we're going to see slight increases of $2,000 for married, filing joint, and qualifying widow with the beginning and the end numbers. And then same thing for single head of household, there's going to be a $1,000 increase um, on the amounts when you start to see the phase out. And if you're married, filing separate, we don't care, uh, $10,000 is your limit. 401k, 403b, 455, 457 plans. Uh, basically, rule of thumb, if traditional and the Roth are gonna stay the same, so are the, these plans uh, as far as the contributions go. 18,000 is gonna be the maximum contribution. If you're over the age of 50, the catch up amount that is allowed is that additional 6,000 for 2017. All right, in 2015, uh, Congress passed the PATH Act um, and what that did is it extended uh, a number of provisions that they were actually going through and you know, basically renewing every year. Um, it made some things just certain law or permanent law, and I'm gonna use that loosely based on the tax reform that we've been referring to. Um, it made some things where they actually went through the tax year 2019, and then some things that went through 2016. Now some of those things that were made permanent are the qualified charitable distributions from IRAs for those individuals who wanna uh, contribute through the IRA. Uh, state and local sales tax deduction and the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Now some of the things that have yet to be voted on uh, that still need to be passed in Congress that we will need to pay attention to for the next month um, is going to be the deduction for mortgage insurance premium, uh, the tuition and fees deduction, basically that above the line that we take on the 1040, and the same thing, uh, the cancellation of debt exclusions from qualified principal resident indebtedness, basically another thing that we're taking above the line on the 1040. So these things have yet to be voted on. Pay attention for the next month. Hopefully they're separate from the tax reform bills. They're not gonna to try to attach these on there. Um, if they do that, they're probably not gonna get passed. Um, hopefully these things will be a separate thing that just get passed at the last minute. So just pay attention to these. All right, so in 2017, um, the uh, US government went through and said, okay, uh, we're gonna give a cost of living increase for those individuals with Social Security. And then we're also going to increase Medicare Part B uh, cost. And so for the 2017 tax year, um, we're at, or 2017 calendar year, we're actually going to see an increase in the Medicare Part B they're actually going to take. Uh, it's going to be 134 per month instead of the 12180 that we saw. As far as the earnings limits go, uh, at full retirement age, there is no limit on the amount of money that you can take. In the year of full retirement, we're talking about 44,880. And then under full retirement, we're talking about 16,920. Now, what I do in my office is I always give my clients these rule of thumb. Here's the things that apply to you. Here are the things that are listed on the IRS, on the Social Security website. However, I always tell them to go to the Social Security Administration to check and make sure that they fall into these categories. And the reason why is not because I don't know these rules, it's because I don't know their full retirement age per the Social Security office. Um, we all know that that number has been increasing for some individuals over the years. It's gone from 65 to 66 to 67, depending on the year you were born and different things along those lines. All right, earned income credit for those children that may or may not be your clients that they're claiming. Um, basically, here's gonna be the amounts we're gonna see. That killed an earlier class, you guys are dead. All right, 48,340 is gonna be the max amount that you can make with three or more qualifying children before you actually see your earned income credit either uh, drop off or completely disappear. For married filing joint individuals, it's gonna be 53,930 whenever it starts to completely disappear. 
Head of household individuals at 45,007 is two qualifying children. Once they get above the 45,007, it goes completely away. Married filing joint, 50,597. For one qualifying child, basically once you reach head of household, 39,617, it's gonna disappear. And then 45,207 for married filing joint is when it's gonna be completely disappear. For no qualifying children, 15,010 is gonna be uh, the max amount that you can make before EIC disappears. And then 20,600 for married filing joint. As far as the earned income credit goes on those little signs that we always see around town for everybody, um, here are the amounts that you're going to see on those little signs. Uh, for the three or more qualifying children, 6,318 is going to be the amount that you can get on the max amount on that little bell curve. 5,616 is going to be with two qualifying children. That's going to be the max amount they can get there. And then 3,400 with one qualifying child. Now, as far as no qualifying children go, that number is going to be 510. Um, as far as these numbers go from this year to last year, there actually wasn't an increase. Um, if there was, it was probably just a few dollars. Um, used to, these numbers would increase by $100, $200. However, this year they did not. As far as the earned income credit goes, uh, the investment income must be less than $3,450. Once you go above that, as far as investment income goes, EIC goes out the door. Um, remember to do your due diligence. Uh, get the proper documentation from your client that you need. Ask the right questions. Make notes in the program of everything that you ask them. Okay? One of the things at Rhodes Murphy that we do is we actually have a two-page EIC worksheet um, that we actually have our preparers give to our clients to fill out while they're in the office with us. Um, and some of the questions that they ask is, uh, in, in the year, did your client live with, or did the child live with you more than six months out of the year? Uh, list the child's name, um, date of birth, social security number, things on those lines, their relationship with you. Uh, do you have documentation showing whether their address is the same as yours, whether it be school records, medical records, whatever it may be? Um, did you provide more than half the cost of the, uh, for the child? Um, did you have uh, the proper documentation to back that up? Things along those lines. And before you ask, I cannot give you that form because our lawyer said so. <laughs> However, um, one thing that I do during tax season um, is I'm a lot faster typer than I am a writer. And so I actually use TaxSlayer software to make notes in the program. And it's one thing that I encourage all of you to do uh, because there is a possibility that you're sitting here making notes by paper and maybe it doesn't get scanned in. Maybe it falls behind another paper. You don't want that to be the reason uh, that something just happened erroneously. You don't, that, you don't want that to be the reason that you get a $500 fine from the IRS. If you put it in the program, back it up properly, it's going to be there. Okay. As far as health savings accounts go, the contribution amounts that you can actually make and actually take. Uh, and for the family in 2017, we saw an increase of 6750 for an individual who's just claiming themselves on their uh, health, and health savings account, we saw an increase of $50 to $3,400. And then age 50 or older is still going to be that additional $1,000 that you're able to contribute. Same-sex marriages um, is something that was passed in 2013 with the federal government. Um, the federal government now recognizes same-sex marriages as being able to file married filing joint. And so uh, with your clients, make sure you understand, make sure they understand uh, that there is this capability for them. Um, however, let them know that some states do not recognize same-sex marriage yet. And so you want to go through, you want to make sure with your state guidelines and legislation that you're able to do this. If not, you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to do two separate state returns. And most likely, you're just going to have to just send those all three off electronically <coughs> differently because you're going to have one federal and two states. All right, the Affordable Care Act. For the 2018 filing season that we're about to come into, um, there actually haven't been any changes. Um, Congress has talked about it. The current administration wants to make changes. However, nothing has been done on the forefront yet that has actually changed what we're going into. So for 2017, uh, basically TaxSlayer is going to help you out in the program. What they're going to do is they're going to ask you a couple of questions to kind of get some background on it. Uh, the first thing they're going to ask that you want to ask the client, uh, did you have minimum essential coverage for the year? Um, another thing they're going to ask is what type of coverage did you have? Did you have Medicare, Medicaid, health insurance through your company, whatever it may have done or may have been? Uh, another question it's going to ask is how many months were you covered? Were you covered the full year? 
and then were all of your dependents enrolled in health insurance as well? All right, forms needed to show minimum central coverage. Over the past four or five years, we've grown accustomed to this. Uh, the first one that actually comes into play is the Form 1095A. This is the form submitted to your client uh, that actually shows the coverage they were offered for health insurance, the months they were covered, the subsidy that they received through the marketplace, things along those lines. Now, it is very important to note, and all of you have probably been in this situation before in this room, is that if you have a client who comes in who was supposed to receive a 1095A and somehow didn't get put on the form, most likely they didn't bring it in or you somehow forgot it, it is going to withhold their refund. Okay? And it's going to be about a two to three month process before they actually get funded on this. And it's a long process where you have to sit there and fax and do different things and your client's going to be upset at you because you didn't ask them about this form. So please, please, you know who your clients are who have had this form before. Um, make sure that you check and they, they have this 1095A. Uh, if you need to, whenever they come in, they don't have the form, just simply call up the marketplace while they're there. You can get all the information right then. Form 1095B basically is going to be for uh, companies with less than 50 individuals. Rhodes Murphy has less than 50 full-time individuals. Um, and so we're going to send our employees 1095Bs. Uh, those are actually going to come from the health insurance companies themselves. As far as 1095Cs, those are going to be for your larger firms. Um, basically, tax slayer with over 100 individuals, uh, they're going to be sending out 1095Cs to their employees. Now, some of the lines that are affected, yes, sir? When's for the deadline for those to be out? So it's actually in a presentation, or actually a little bit later in the presentation, but all of those are just like W-2s. They're supposed to be to the employee or to the client now uh, by January 31st. They're just like a W-2 now. They used to say that you could get it out in 228. Last year was the first year they said get it out 131. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, ma'am. But your clients, your clients must be a lot better than my clients. Your clients must remember their username and password. My clients do not. So, uh, but yeah, you can you can go that route and actually go on healthcare.gov and get it. Um, correct. Or you can actually call, and so either one works. All right. As far as the lines that are affected on the 1040 uh, by the Affordable Care Act, we're going to see three different line items on the back of the 1040 that are actually affected. Uh, the first one is going to be line 46. This is going to be the excessive advanced premium tax credit repayment. Basically, if your client received too much in a subsidy, this is where it's going to pop up. Hopefully, uh, all of us have had less scare stories than we have in the years past. Um, I know a couple of years ago I told the class that I had a client who actually had to repay back around $8,000 uh, simply because of capital gains that they had that were not uh, that they weren't expecting. Um, but hopefully. You've actually educated clients. Uh, call the marketplace if any changes come up. Make sure they know what to do in those situations. Uh, line 61 is just basically going to be a checkbox. Uh, this is going to say this person has minimum essential coverage. Nothing to worry about there. And then line 69 is going to be the amount of net premium tax credit refundable. Okay. And so if someone didn't receive enough of a subsidy, this is where this actually comes into play. The Affordable Care Act, uh, one of the major forms that you're going to see is the Form 8962. Uh, this is used to figure the premium tax credit um, or to reconcile the advanced premium tax credit received through the exchange. Uh, the taxpayer, if they received a 1095A, they need to file this form. And most of the time, whenever you have a client who did not bring in the 1095A, you're going to have to fax the, uh, fax the IRS the 1095A and the 8962 explaining their situation and then they'll make the necessary changes from there. Again, if your taxpayer does not provide this form, uh, their return will not be processed. So some important reminders. Um, one thing that you need to do as taxpayers is you need to educate your clients as much as possible on certain situations. One of them is the Affordable Care Act with the 1095A. If they have changes in their household, whether it be monetary or whether it be the size of their household, they need to let the IRS or the marketplace know of these changes. Okay? Because if they don't, they're going to see it on their return and then they're going to be mad at you. All right, the Affordable Care Act uh, Form 8965 has a place for exemptions. Um, there are two types of exemptions. There are the exemptions that we as tax preparers give and then there are the type that come through the marketplace. 
Now, if you know you're going to have a client who probably isn't going to get health insurance, who's going to be above the filing threshold, let's say $25,000, something along those lines for a single individual, why not get them to try to call the IRS or the marketplace to try to get an exemption? Because what it does is it adds more credibility to the fact that they cannot afford health insurance and it takes the liability off of us as tax preparers. And so it makes it a lot easier whenever you can actually show a sheet of paper from the marketplace showing that there is an exemption for your client. Another thing to remember is that there are exemptions that we as tax repairs can determine to give to our clients. Some of those are short gap coverage. Uh, the coverage is considered unaffordable, income below the return filing threshold, and then citizens living abroad and certain non-citizens. Now, as far as the coverage is considered unaffordable, make sure to check with whatever state you're with as far as the poverty line goes, because those things change from state to state. As far as the, the income below the return filing threshold, the tax layer program actually does a great job of this. As soon as it populates, they're below that. You don't have to worry about the penalty marking up because the 8965 is already going to be marked for that. As far as the Affordable Care Act goes with the penalties, Basically, these penalties are going to be the same from 2016 to 2017. For an adult, uh, just at themselves, it's going to be $695. For a child, it's going to be $347.50 with a max of $2,085 that they can get as a penalty. Or they go to the higher of the $2,085 or the 2.5% 2 of household income. Now, one important thing to note is that the tax is lower proportionally for any months that they were covered. So they had six months. That uh, proportionally is going to go down depending on their situation. However, with those clients who are going to ask what is going to be the penalty for next year, because I still want to get insurance, I'm going to try to weigh is it cheaper for me not to get health insurance or is it me to just take the penalty, the penalty amounts haven't been determined yet simply because it's something that the current administration, Congress, are kind of arguing back and forth on as far as health insurance goes. Uh, we're not really sure if there will be penalties. We're not really sure if they'll decrease, but most likely they'll increase based on what we've known over the past four years. It started very small with these penalties and now they're up to $2,000. All right, for the Affordable Care Act, as far as the business side goes, all companies must be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act for 2017. Okay? Firms that have less than 50 individuals, uh, they are required to file certain forms. That's going to be the 1095B and the 1094B. And then for firms like TaxSlayer that are over 50 individuals, um, they're actually going to have to file the 1095C and the 1094C. And so that's what actually this next slide goes into, is the 1095C is to employees uh, that are employed by uh, larger firms, uh, 50 or more individuals. That 1095C is supposed to be those individuals by 131. A couple of years ago it was 228, now it's 131. The 1094C is basically a compilation of what actually takes place and transpires on the 1095C for the individuals. It's just a summary of everybody that's covered, what's covered and what's offered, and that is due to the IRS by 228. Basically, uh, if you have a health insurance firm that does this, that's basically going to be their charge here. Same thing with 1095B, that's going to be for uh, companies less than 50. Basically those are due to the individuals by 131. The 1094B is actually due to the IRS by 228. So depreciation, so one of the things that the PATH Act did is it actually talked about bonus depreciation in section 179. So the PATH Act of 2015, what it did, uh, the bonus depreciation will be in effect of 50% in 2017, same as it was in 2016. However, in 2018, that number is going to drop to 40%. And then in 2019, it's going to drop to 30. And most likely, depending on the trend that we're looking at here, it's most likely going to dis disappear in 2020. Another thing that became permanent uh, with the PATH Act is the Qualified Leasehold Improvement Property. Um, that was extended fully with the, uh, the PATH Act there in 2015. And then something else, if you have clients who can take advantage of Section 179 expense, uh, that $500,000 that they can take as a deduction is something that is huge, that has been extended, um, and that is still there. Uh, just remember that the base maximum threshold is still $2 million, and so once it goes to $2 million to two point five, you're going to start to see that $500,000 start to dwindle down. Uh, contributions to SEP and profit sharing plans. Um, it's going to be an increase from 2016 to 2017 up to the 54,000 number we see here listed. 
or it's going to be the lesser of that your client can take of the 25% of the employee's compensation. So whichever one is lower, the 25 or the 54. Now as far as business tax return deadlines go, it's going to be something new that we saw in 2016 tax year, uh, that's, or 2017 tax year that's still going to be in place around 2018 tax year. Um, anything basically, what my rule of thumb is, anything with a K-1 other than a trust or an estate is due by 315. And so your partnerships and your S corps are going to be due by 315 and they're going to still get that six month extension to 915. As far as the C corps go, those are going to be due on 415. Their extension goes to 1015. And then as far as your trust and estate returns go, those are going to be due 415 and their extension is going to be on 930. So there's still that threshold between 930 and 1015 for you to take care of your individual extensions that come into play. Now one thing I always try to do with my business tax returns is I always try to get them done during the season on time and the reason why is because these individuals they already have enough to worry about the last thing they want to worry about is having to file taxes in July, September, something along those lines and it just gets into a bad practice. Uh, the only one that's been moved April 15th is the C Corp, the, 11, uh, the 1120. Uh, no, just the 1120. The, 11, the 1120S is uh, going to be 315 because it has a K1 involved. Yeah, partnership and uh, S Corp, right? Correct, yeah. And so. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. The, the 1065 was. Okay. So it was just the 11, just the 1065 that was moved then. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry. I, I will do a respective next year. Respective only to 1065. All right, current guys. I'm on camera. You're calling me out like this. Gosh, you're killing me. All right, current tax rates and exemptions. Um, as far as the estate tax, the gift tax and then the generation skipping uh, transfer that we're going to see. Those numbers are going to be uh, 5.49 for 2017. Uh, it could be a possibility that we don't even have to worry about the estate tax exemption. However, as I was referring to earlier in the tax reform, if they double this number, most likely they're probably going to double these numbers. It's always been the same in the past. Um, as far as the tax rates for these three go, it's still going to be at the 40%. One thing that was new in 2016 that actually happened on June 30th is that the government said that a Form 706 would need to be filed as far as with the U.S. state and generation skipping transfer tax returns go. Um, what they're trying to do here is executors are required to provide the basis that is actually for these returns and what they're trying to get away from is individuals using an inflated basis whenever they actually go to uh, either sell these assets or actually distinguish or uh, disperse them. Um, as far as the annual gift exclusion goes, it's $14,000 is going to be the amount from 2016 to 2017 going to stay the same. Now as far as things that actually go on and happen uh, that I actually want us to be aware of as far as practitioners go, um, one thing that has been going on over the past few years is that, I, is that scammers have basically gotten smarter. Um, we're all used to the IRS phone calls, we're all used to the fraudulent IRS letters that come to our clients. As far as the phone calls go, they're going to call up the clients and scare them, basically say, hey, you need to pay this amount or the cops are going to come get you. Um, what I always tell my clients, the IRS never calls them. I try to educate them during the season on this and especially my elderly clients is because those are the ones that are most susceptible to this. Um, they get really scared in those situations. They go ahead and just give the amount over the phone and it's impossible to get back. Um, now one thing I always tell my clients and inform them on is that I'm telling you this information, spread it to your friends. Because most likely if you're getting this call, they're probably going to call your friends in the neighborhood as well because they hit certain areas at certain times. And that's why you'll get 10 of those phone calls in a day. Um, as far as the IRS letters go, the one thing I always tell my clients is always just call the IRS, just the 800 number that's listed there, uh, just to make sure that it's actually real. If it is real, uh, then call me. We'll go ahead and get started on the process of actually making sure it's corrected. Um, one thing I do tell uh, my clients you know, one thing I'll tell you guys, which I'm actually surprised on, I actually shared this last year, and not a lot of people know this, is that the IRS actually opens at 7.30 in the morning. 
Um, you can actually call them then and you get through within five minutes to someone. Now if you wait till eight o'clock, you're actually gonna probably get a five minute wait or an hour wait um, and it makes it a lot harder. Uh, one thing that I've done in my office and I've implemented is that I don't call the IRS unless it's 7.30. Um, I tell my clients, either you're going to meet me there at 7.30 before the office opens, we're going to take care of this, or this notice isn't important enough for you and you're going to have to take care of this yourself. Um, simply because waiting to call at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday and waiting there for two hours on the phone and then getting disconnected is not worth your time or your client's time. Okay? As far as identity theft and fraud goes, um, it continues to climb each year. Uh, the IRS plans to implement certain things, however they've said that for a number of years. They're basically playing catch up behind the scammers. Um, they can't come out with the new and exciting things until the scammers do. Um, as, far as, uh, the, as far as other things that you can tell your clients, um, I always inform my clients if they're really worried about actually getting uh, their information stolen, to go get a credit monitoring service. It'll help them uh, check, make sure no one else is using their social security number, make sure no one is taking credit out of their name, um, things along those lines. And then one thing I always tell people, and it was the very last class that I had last year that I was actually informed of this, um, is that if you have a client who you know is basically competing with someone to claim their child. Now if the person is supposed to be the one claiming the child, uh, the other person is not, what I would tell them to do is to get a PIN number for that child. Now right now, I think the PIN service is pending whether it's actually still up or not, so you'd have to check on that. Um, but if you're able to, to get a PIN number for that child. Um, it is identity theft if someone else is claiming the child when they're not supposed to. That would actually stop that process, just like it does with a taxpayer or with a spouse that has to put the PIN number in the program. Um, so security ID will, will fall under that credit line, correct? Right? Yes, it, it will, yeah, it should. The part, uh, one of the partners? Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. It, it, you get a new number. You get a new number every year, um, and then it was fun. What was it? Two years ago, where the IRS sent out the letters and put the wrong year on it. Yeah. And so that was fun too. Yeah. Was. No, it did change. Um, she's um, a single parent and the father of her child mm -hmm. always strikes me. It's always that scenario. So the only thing that we have done so far is I tell her as soon as you get your W-2, mm -hmm. I mean, the first one who gets... Correct. You know, Correct. I mean, because, yeah. uh, and, and, and that's, it. it's one way to go about that and you're just playing a betting game. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I've actually told people, you know, if you can get the PIN number for the child, yeah. You're still going to be in the exact same situation. You're going to try to get in there early as possible to go ahead and do it. But if it actually pays off from there forward, you know that no one else can claim your child. Right. And so it's actually something that you can do to handle it. Now, as far as the pre-season or pre-tax season checklist goes, um, a number of things I always tell the individuals in this class uh, is to make sure that you're covered on a number of things. You're actually doing one of them today. Uh, you're getting your continuing education hours. Uh, make sure that you get enough hours for whatever, uh, how many, however many hours that you need, depending on whether you're a CPA, EA, whatever it may be. Uh, as far as P10 renewal goes, uh, P10 renewal is open. Um, as far as new applicants go, it's a $50 fee. Uh, I think you can still do it online, but I'm not sure on that one. You might have to actually send it in paper. Um, but as far as people who are renewing, it's free. And so uh, for us who have been tax preparers for a number of years who still have that P10, it's actually free for us. Uh, make sure all your preparers and staff are up to date on their due diligence. Um, it's going to start coming around here shortly. You're going to have bank products, uh, that your bank due diligence that you're going to have to do, uh, the earned income tax credit due diligence, things along those lines. Final thing, uh, as far as forms go, uh, W-2s, 1099s, things along those lines. Uh, 1095s, they're supposed to be submitted and given to your client by their employer, whoever it may be, by January 31st. Um, there are a couple of exemptions. Exemptions include, but are not limited to, uh, 1099Bs. Um, those are to be done by February 15th. What I always tell my clients though is let's, let's wait till March when that corrected one comes in um, and let's go ahead and let's file that then. Um, I just, you know the corrected's gonna come and so it's just a whole lot easier to take care of it a month later uh, than to have to send it an amended. Uh, as far as tax season goes, tax season is planned to begin at its normal time, 
probably around January 22nd. So they said that today? Because uh, yesterday they told us they didn't know. I read on their website it said January 22nd, whenever I was doing this two weeks ago. Wow, that was yesterday in the general session they said that. Who are you going to listen to, me or her? You. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. Um, most likely tax layer is going to start accepting returns to them probably around January 15th, like they always have. Uh, they're probably going to send off a couple of test ones with the IRS, something along those lines. And then when the official date opens, that's whenever they're going to send it properly to the IRS. Okay? Um, however, expect uh, that refunds are going to be delayed again this year, um, simply because they're trying to do more fraud detection, things along those lines, especially on returns that contain uh, the earned income tax credit and the additional child tax credit. Um, those will probably again be delayed until February 15th or so. Um, so that's just going to be there. And this applies to the whole refund. Okay. All right, guys. Any questions on anything? Possibly with the tax software. Um, tax layer software, uh, we're probably talking December as far as December. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, and, and well, then you're going to get constant updates anyway, so it's going to be okay. Yeah. And then the state's not going to come out until mid-January, so you're good. All right. Uh, as far as any other questions, guys, anything, have anything else?